Be speaking about uh, is about the issue of uh, image representation. And I'll speak about also the work uh, of a PhD student, uh, Joanne Bruna, uh, who is at uh, Ecole Polytechnique. So the issue of image representation is an old uh, question which has been very much studied in the framework of low-level signal processing. What I mean by low-level signal processing is compression for storage transmission, image restoration, denoising, inverse problem, missing data, and so on. And in all this area, a lot of work has been done, and what emerged as a key idea is the ability to build what is called a sparse representation, which means taking uh, the data, which is typically a huge amount of data, and try to represent it with as few parameters as possible. And a lot of mathematical tools have been developed around. So first of all, of course, Fourier transform, wavelet transform, all kind of adaptive representations in dictionaries with multiple applications. For example, compression, where you have here a sparse representation in a wavelet basis. Key idea, again, you try to keep as few coefficients as possible. In this case, the compression factor was about uh, 16 and JPEG 2000 restore an image from these uh, few coefficients. You have many applications on inverse problem. This was a work that was done by Niki, Elad, uh, uh, Guillermo Shapiro, and Merad, where basically where, what you see here is an image with very, very few pixels. About 80% of the pixels are missing. And here you have this whole class of inverse problems. But because the image can be represented with very few parameters, because it has a sparse representation, even though you have very few measurements, you can try to basically inverse the problem, the linear system, and you get an excellent recovery of the original image. So you have a huge set of applications, and I would say that this is an area which is pretty well mastered from a mathematical point of view, from uh, engineering and application point of view, although, of course, there are all kind of interesting questions and algorithms that are coming out constantly. Now, if you look at this other area, which is image interpretation, compared to this other relatively civilized world, it's a kind of wild west. I mean, there are a lot of very nice ideas, but very few things are uh, understood. The issue, of course, is to try to detect and uh, interpret images, image patterns. And the difficulty is that images are incredibly complex have textures, you have 3D shapes which are completely deformed. And the issue here, if you think of it in terms of image representation, you may think, well, let's take the tools that we know and that we love to handle in low-level image processing and try to transpose it. And let's think, for example, of building a sparse representation of that. That will not lead you so far. Why? Because the problem is completely different. The issue here is not about restoring with the highest possible quality the image, the issue is essentially the opposite. Try to eliminate the information as smartly as possible so that the remaining piece of information is stable for classification. And how to do it, there are, as I said, very smart algorithmic ideas that have been developed especially for the last 10 years in uh, computer vision. But the problem remains mostly a mystery, at least from a mathematical point of view. There's still very little understanding on how to approach this problem with the same kind of basic principle we've seen appearing for low-level image processing. Okay, if you go to psychophysics, there are a few elements which are interesting just to mention. It's very well known since the 1960s the work of Hubble and Wiesel, that if you go in the visual cortex, which is in the back of the brain, you have this region called V1, and there you can observe the hypercolumnar structure where you have different types of cells. Among these cells, there are neurons called simple cells, which in a first approximation, given all kind of nonlinearities, do have some kind of linear behavior. And if you measure this linear behavior, depending upon where you look, in the cortex, you will see impulse response, which looks a little bit like wavelets, dilated. And when you turn around the center of this pinwheel, you have the orientation, spatial orientation of the wavelet, which change. So there has been hundreds of 
physiological paper trying to measure this impulse response, and some of the models, are, well, almost all of them are based on Gabor functions, namely a Gaussian, which is modulated by a sine wave and with different orientation. So this is relatively, at least partly understood. What is absolutely not understood is what's happening for the complex cells. So you have all these simple cells which are feeding into cells which are called complex because basically nobody understands what they're really doing. The only thing that we understand well is that they are fully nonlinear. They have a support which is much larger than the simple cell and they inhibit some kind of environment in the sense that when the stimuli moves on the retina, the response of the complex cells have a tendency not to change so much, even when the stimuli is scaled. So you have this notion of invariance which is coming in, and the question is what are they doing and why are they doing that kind of thing? Then you have the visual pathway which goes from V1 to V2, V3, V4, and if you move in V4, you have some cells which get to be very specialized. There are these so-called grandmother cells, and a caricature of these cells uh, consists in saying that, for example, if a cell is tuned to your grandmother, then it will be completely invariant to whatever pose, expression, and so on your grandmother will have. It will fire if it's your grandmother. It will not fire if it's not your grandmother. So you see that there is this concept of invariance which is appearing here in the visual system, and sim very similar things appear in the audio system. And one of the questions is, of course, why and how such uh, invariant could be implemented or understood. OK, let me come back to images and the, the issue of image classification. One of the big difficulties, of course, of image is that an image is an element of a very high dimensional space. And if you look at the distribution of an image within a given class, Generally, this distribution is what? Well. It is not on any kind of regular manifold structure. So, and that will be one of the source of difficulty. Let me just show you a very simple example. Take the example of digit classification. So one image is a digit, and you have, for example, the class of digit one, which is a handwritten one with all the possible different ways to write a one or a nine or an eight and so on. Okay, you can see an image like that as a point in a high dimensional space. What I'm saying here is that if you take all the digits representing a one, you'll have a set of points and this point, these points belong to a low dimensional manifold because in this case a one has few parameters, but this manifold is absolutely not regular. Why isn't it regular? Because if you translate your digit one just a little bit, the support will not overlap anymore, so you have an orthogonal function. So a very small perturbation and boom, the function goes in a completely different place. If you take your function and you deform it, like a slight rotation, same thing, suddenly the uh, support is almost not uh, overlapping, so boom, the function goes very far away. And so if you look at the set of points corresponding to this function, they are very much spread. If you take another class, let's say a three, you'll have another set of distribution, and in fact, the three looks much more like the one here than the others. In other words, the three, from the point of view of a Euclidean distance, are sometimes much closer to a one than to another three. So the question is, how to try to organize this kind of data? Now, if you look at a different problem, texture recognition, which is one of the very nice open problem in image processing. For the last 30 years, there has been a multiple uh, number of theories to try to understand texture. In this case, you don't have even a low dimensional manifold. Textures spans a very high dimensional manifold. So what's the problem of texture recognition? You have an image like that, and you have to find out whether this texture is the same as this one or not, and in this case, you will immediately see that these two textures are different. What's the difficulty of textures? Textures can be modeled as stationary processes. Good. On the other hand, these processes have none of the mathematical property we like to handle. They are certainly not Gaussian, 
they are not Markovian, they don't have any of the standard mathematical properties which makes the analysis simple. These two textures have the same power spectrum. In other words, they have same second order moment and although it's the case, you can very easily discriminate them. If you look at this texture, this is a realization of a Gaussian white noise. So it essentially lives everywhere within your space. Certainly cannot be reduced to a low dimensional manifold. Despite that, within one tenth of a second, you are shown two such texture and you can discriminate them. So the question is, if you have such a problem again, how do you build a representation? And of course what you'd like is that the appropriate representation should work for texture, for digit, for whatever classes of functions or signals. Okay, so what's the dream? One dream could be, let's take this wild set of samples in these different classes, and let's try to build a representation where in your final space, everything will be easy. Everything will be easy, meaning the samples would belong to low dimensional regular manifold. To do that, you need to reduce variability. Within your class, you have a lot of variability, which is not really useful for discriminating the different class. You need to rebuild some kind of regularity, which is not apparent here. And the last thing, you need to maintain, of course, discriminability between the different classes. You don't want to squeeze them together. Okay, so what kind of ideas can one have for doing so? And all these things, of course, have been very much studied in computer vision. First observation, image classification is environed by translation. If you have an object, you translate it, of course, it's the same object. So you don't care about translation. In the same way, if you have a scaling factor, because the distance to your retina change, it shouldn't affect the classification. So you have very intuitively, of course, this notion of invariance which comes in, translation scaling. And being invariant means you already reduce the variability of your class. What is more subtle is that you are also sensitive to elastic deformations and that provides a very natural metric which is used again very much in computer vision in particular in medical image processing. If you have an image like that which is being deformed, we perceive this deformation and you would say that this image is more far away than this one because the deformation is bigger. So what is the deformation? The deformation is a simple operator which essentially can be viewed as a translation but a translation which depends upon the point, as long as the deformation is not too big. So tau of x is now a displacement field which depends upon the point. And locally, if you make a Taylor series approximation, you can view any such deformation as being a translation plus a deformation operator which is given by the gradient of the displacement field. And the elasticity term of this deformation is just given by the norm of this matrix over there. And you can look at the maximum deformation of the image. It will be the maximum size of the norm over there. So that would be a natural metric giving you the distance between two images. OK, so what do we, what we would like to do? We would like to build a representation such that the Euclidean distance within this representation provides a natural metric for classification. So first property, we would like to reduce variability, build environs, environs to finite groups such as translation, dilation, rotation, whatever, and I'll discuss about that a bit later. So in this case here, I look at translation. Dito of f is just a simple translation of f, and what you'd like is that the representation of the translated signal should be the same as the representation of the original. This is a very weak property. There are millions of ways to do so, and we'll look at two sim few simple ways to do so. What is more subtle, as I said, is to handle the deformation. If now your image is deformed, what you would like is that the distance between the representation of F and the representation of the deformed image should be of the order of the deformation size. If the deformation is small, the distance should be small. And you should have this result with a simple Euclidean result, 
without having to do any kind of registration. So that's what we're going to study. And we'll try to see how to take this mathematical problem and build such representation. So I'm going to begin with the simplest idea one can think. Let's begin with averaging. Then we'll look at the Fourier transform, which provides a possible solution. And we'll see, including wavelets, that all these tools essentially don't work for tackling this problem, at least as such. So what I propose to look at is at a kind of a convolution network. What I'll show is that this kind of property can be reached with a computational structure which is essentially a convolution network called the, uh, yeah, which is essentially, sorry, a neural network, which is a particular type called convolution networks. And the key idea behind that will be progressively reduce variability with contractive operators. So we'll look at applications for representing stationary processes and textures for also uh, classifying patterns such as digit and I'll speak briefly about extensions to general groups. Okay, invariance. So maybe the simplest way to do so is just average. Take a low pass filter, Firefox, and you just dilate your low pass filter. So if you have F over there, F is now smooth through the convolution. And if F is translated just a little bit, because of the smoothing, the translation won't, be, won't uh, provide so much modification as long as the translation is small relatively to the size of the averaging. Now, if the averaging goes to infinity, it converges to a constant. And of course, the average, which is this constant, is fully invariant to translation. Okay. There, you can verify, of course, you are completely stable to deformation. You are Lipschitz continuous to deformation. The only problem is that you lose almost all the information. Through the averaging, you've lost all high frequencies and intermediate frequencies, so you lost everything. You are invariant, but you lost the information. Okay, how do you, can one recover high frequency information? The natural way is to use a Fourier transform. If your signal is a translation of a signal F, then the Fourier transform just has a phase shift. So now if you look at the modulus of the Fourier transform, of course the modulus of the Fourier transform is invariant to translation. Okay, so this representation is a representation which is invariant to translation. What's the problem? The problem is when you make a deformation. Because high frequencies will be very severely modified by uh, deformation which are not translation. If you look at such a deformation, if your signal has energy at a high frequency psi, what is relatively easy to check is that in the Fourier domain, if you just look at the modulus, so you kill the phase, the distance between the modulus of the deformed signal and the original signal will be proportional to the deformation gradient but multiplied by the highest frequencies. In other words, high frequency will move very much and therefore it's not stable to deformation. That's why nobody used Fourier transform in computer vision to represent images. Okay, so what could you do? Well, you want something which is stable to dilation. So why not using a wavelet transform? So how do you build a wavelet? You can take an envelope, let's say a Gaussian that you modulate with a sine wave. So you have a bandpass filter. Your bandpass filter, you rotate it with all possible rotation, like what I've shown for simple cells. You dilate it with all possible dilation, factor two. And now the way that transform, I, have, I won't speak about orthogonal basis. I will just use something much simpler, a simple filter bank with no subsampling. You take your signal, you carry the low frequencies, and then the high frequencies, you represent them through these filter bank, through these convolution with wavelets, with all possible orientations and all scales. And if you make sure that your Fourier domain is fully covered by your bandpass filters, you verify that you have an energy conservation. You have a unitary operator, in other words, the norm of the wavelet transform 
which is here defined as the sum of the norm of each of its components over there, will recover the norm of the signal. Okay, so that's the wavelet transfer. Can we apply it for having an environment? Well, the problem is the wavelet transform is certainly not translation environment. It's a convolution. So if the signal translates, the wavelet transform will translate as well. Take, for example, a signal which is a sum of two Dirac. The wavelet transform will give you back the wavelet. Here I have two of them because I have the real part and the imaginary part in green and red. And the second Dirac will give you the same thing translated. So you are absolutely not translation environment. So what can we do? Well, we could do the same kind of thing as in the Fourier domain. You can kill the phase, kill the phase by computing the modulus, and then you get the envelope over there. The envelope is a little bit more regular because you've killed the phase fluctuation. So if you have very small translation, it's OK. But of course, if the translation is a little bit too big, like here, you will see two different patterns. So what can you do to improve the uh, environment. Well, you can average, as I described initially. So you take these two things, this uh, modulus, and you average it. And that's essentially what this well-known descriptor called SIFT is doing in image processing. It's taking images, filtering along all possible dire uh, direction, killing the phase, and making an average. It's doing that through a histogram, but essentially that's what it's being done. There is another descriptor which is doing that in audio. It's called the MEL spectrum. If you look at the MEL spectrum, that's exactly that. It's making a filter bank, then it puts the energy in different MEL bands, uh, MEL fil uh, frequency bands, and it gets the energy within a given window. So whether it's in image processing or in audio, these are the basic descriptors that are currently being used for doing recognition, and they are indeed pretty efficient. They are pretty efficient, but as you can see, they lose a lot of information. Here, you had two Dirac's, two structures, and you cannot anymore say whether you have two structures or only one. The result of that is that all these descriptors are calculated over very small windows in order not to average too much question we are having here, can we recover the lost information? Does invariance mean losing a lot of information or it's, impos or it's possible to recover back the information? Okay, where did we lose information? Through this averaging. But this averaging, I can always view it as just the first term of the wavelet transform of this modulus. If I get back the wavelet coefficients, of course, I can invert the wavelet transform, so recover the modulus, recover the lost information. The problem is, all these terms are absolutely not invariant to translation. So how can I make them invariant to translation? Same thing. You can kill the phase over there, and then average. And what do you get here? What you are getting here is information which is basically a co-occurrence information. It's giving you information about the function f at the scale 2 of j1 and the scale 2 of j2, at an angle gamma 1 and an angle gamma 2. But there you've lost again information because of this averaging. Well, you can just repeat that. So what does it mean? It means you begin with f and you compute the average of f, and what's the loss information? These are all the wavelet coefficients. You kill the phase. For each of these coefficients, and you have many functions of, many signals over there, each of them, you transform it again. You have the average and all the bandpass filters. You kill the phase, and you repeat. You get the average, this is the invariant coefficient, and the next layer and you iterate. At the level m, all these wavelet coefficients will yield the average and all of them. What you see appearing here is a neural network. At each stage, the function has been splitted through many neurons. Each neuron is doing a linear operation and a nonlinear operation, which is the modulus. And then it's cascaded. The only thing is that in this neural network, what will recover is not what is at the end, 
and in fact we'll see that what goes to the at the end goes to zero will recover all the layers all these layers the average the first order wavelet coefficient second order core currents coefficient and order core currents coefficient and you see you go from one function and you explode this function in an infinite number of function and each time you have more more and more because each time you explode one function into an infinite number of wavelet functions. So that's the output. That's what I call here the scattering operator because it scatters the information and their relations with scattering uh, phenomena in physics. You have all these first, second, and mth order wavelet coefficient with the modulus and finally the average. Okay, so what's the norm? What we're interested in here is to analyze the property of the resulting metric. The norm will just be, like in the wavelet case, the sum of the norm of each of the gathered signal. So for all infinite number of scale, all orientations, and all the order from zero to potentially plus infinity. Now, one thing that is clear, this is a contractive operator. Why is it a contractive operator? Because the way it was built is just by applying a unitary operator and a modulus, which is a contractive operator. So we just cascade one after the other contractive operators. And a cascade of contractive operators gives you a contractive operator, namely the distance in the scattering domain will be smaller than the distance between the two functions. Now, what is more interesting and a bit more subtle is what's happening when you let M increase. When you let M increase at the bottom layer of your network, you have a huge number of functions. However, if you sum the energy of all these functions and you let the depth of the network go to infinity, it's going to converge to zero. That's what you can prove. And as a result, you get a unitary operator. That means that all the energy goes out on the side and the total energy of your scattering operator will be equal to the energy of the original signal. So all the information, and let's say all the energy, has been transformed into an invariant energy. Now, when you compute, the situation doesn't look as bad as it looks here. Why? Because, in fact, all these coefficients are averaged with this convolution with phi j. So you can subsample them. And if you subsample them at the scale of the average, then you can realize that the number of non-zero coefficients you are going to get is of the order of the size of the original signal. And if you apply an FFT to compute all the convolution, you get basically an n log n algorithm to do the calculation. So this is an example. An image, that's the scattering representation. The order one are all the wavelet coefficients, different scale and orientation. Order two, all the co-occurrence coefficient between all possible scale and orientation. There are much more, of course, much more of them. Order three, you have even much more because you have all possible combinations. And you can see that the amplitude of the coefficient have a tendency to decrease exponentially. This is another image. And the idea now is if you have two images which are translated deformed, which is very complicated to compare. You just have to do a simple L2 norm, Euclidean distance between these two, to measure the deformations and to be insensitive to translation. So why are you insensitive to translation? Because when the scale increase, as I said, it's going to converge to the integral, to the average, and the average is not going to change when F is translated. So, if you let j increase, you can indeed verify that the norm is going to converge. And now if g here is just a translation of f, the distance between the scattering representation of f and f translated, when j goes to infinity, is going to go to zero, which tells you essentially that you have a translation invariant representation. OK, but as I said, there is nothing great about having a translation invariant representation. The Fourier transform just by killing the phase gives you the same result. The key property you want is deformation. What's happening if you take your signal and now you deform it with a deformation gradient which is not zero? Then if you look at the distance in the scattering domain, you can verify that the distance is essentially going to be proportional to the uh, deformation gradient up to a lock term. 
And the reason is you are building your translation environments by killing translation at all scales, at very fine scale, larger, 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 through the phase of the wavelet coefficients. And if you look at the commutator between the two operators, they almost commute, and as a result, you get that. And that's the key thing that will make all the algorithm work, is stability to deformation. Okay, let me first, before showing examples and algorithms, say what's happening when you have a, a stationary process which is important for textures. If you have a stationary process, which is ergodic, then the scattering transform is going to converge to the expected value. You have uh, a consistent result so that in the scattering domain, these coefficients that in the case of a Gaussian white noise may belong to a huge unit, uh, uh, let's say the uh, unit sphere of the space is going to converge to a very small ball around the centroid. So that to compare two processes, we'll just have to compare the scattering representation of a single re realization. If the distance is going to zero, then essentially it's the same process. If the distance is not zero, then it will come out, out of two different processes. In other words, suddenly you have a different representation of stationary processes than the standard power spectrum representation. This representation gives you the expected value of F, the expected value of all convolution with wavelet modulus, wavelet modulus, and so on, at all possible order. You can verify that you have the same property as in uh, power spectrum, if you sum uh, the uh, energy square, you recover the energy of the process. So you have very similar property, although here you are completely nonlinear. This is a representation of two examples, two processes. This is the expected scattering vector of this texture. This is the expected scattering vector of this texture. To compare the two, you just have to compare these two vectors, subtract them, and see whether the difference is small or not small. So we are going to do classification out of that, and that's all the work of Jean Brunard. So the classification problem is the following. You have k classes, which is each of them is a set of signals that you can always view as a realization of a random process fk. The process, of, of course, is not stationary. It has no particular property besides representing a class like digits or whatever, bicycles. First thing, you do a scattering transform. And because you build up the Lipschitz regularity to deformation, in this domain, you are going to get smooth manifold, at least locally smooth manifold. Then we're going to do the most naive classifier. And here the spirit is very much similar to what is done in uh, low-level signal processing. In low-level signal processing, the idea is you build a sparse representation and then you do very simple things like thresholding, quantization, and so on. The idea is to do the equivalent. You build your representation and then you use the simplest uh, uh, classifier like linear SVM or PCA or so on. And in fact, this can be viewed as a kernel for uh, an SVM classifier. In this case, we're just going to take these manifold, and because they are regular, we're just going to approximate them with an affine space. So how do you build an affine ap space approximation? You take the centroid, the expected value, and then you define a linear space which carries the D principal direction of variations. This is basically a PCA. You take a PCA, and out of the PCA, you get out the uh, linear space which carries the largest variations. So for two classes, you're going to get two affine spaces that will now be the model of the class. If you have a new signal F that you want to classify, you go into the scattering domain, you have the transform of F, and then you find what is the best approximation of your scattering transform, which affine space best approximate it by computing the projection on the linear space and just calculating the distance. And that gives you the class. So it's again a very simple algorithm. Just one thing. This algorithm, contrary to something like uh, uh, a linear discriminant algorithm like SVM, doesn't learn by trying to compare in class. For example, you don't learn about 
socks by comparing socks with lines, with chairs, and so on. Each class is learned independently one from the other by just calculating the linear space approximating the manifold. Okay, what does that give for texture? Uh, there are two parameters which are estimated here, which is the scale of invariance. How big the scale of invariance should be. You just do a cross-validation to see what is the best scale. And what's the dimension of the approximation space? Same thing, it's a cross-validation. So this is a standard database that is developed in uh, uh, Berkeley, which is used for uh, most uh, texture discrimination now in computer vision. So you have 61 class corresponding to different material under different illumination rotations. Each class is so has many realization corresponding, as I said, to different piece of the material, different rotation illumination. The state of the art was obtained with Markov random fields, with relatively heavy Gibbs sampler, with 23 uh, training example per class to learn the stochastic model the uh, recognition which was the best rate obtained was about 22%, but when it goes to 46%, the error drops to 2%. With the algorithm that I described, which is implemented on a simple laptop like that, it's very fast. With 23 samples per class, you have a factor 20 drop. It's 1%. With 46 samples per class, it goes to 0.1%, so you still have a factor 20 uh, drop with the state of the art. There are very interesting open questions behind all that. Why? Suddenly you have a different representation of stationary processes, which are able to carry non-Gaussian properties, whereas normally this is done very often uh, with high order moments. You still work with first and second order moments, but of a very nonlinear representation. Now, why you have really this level of accuracy and what are the underlying properties? As I said, there are many interesting open problems uh, behind it. What's happening for MNIST? MNIST is this huge database of digits, which is again a very standard uh, classification algorithm. State of the art was obtained by convolution network, uh, in particular by Luca. I must say, all this work is very much inspired by all what has been done in computer vision. We've just been trying to re-understand that from a math point of view, which led to slightly different algorithms. Training size, if you only have 300 digits to learn from, convolution network gives you 7% error. 40,000 digits, about 0.65% error. So when you have a huge number of samples, then the precision gets very good. That's the results that we have with this algorithm. Below 5,000 samples, basically we have the state of the art. Beyond, as you see, it goes to 0.78% instead of 65%. So convolution network works slightly better. This is the dimension of the space that we are learning. And you can see that, in fact, it's very low dimensional space. The dimension D, which is basically the dimension of the number of direction of, uh, of uh, deformation that you are learning, increase when you have more sample. Now, learning is really about learning in that range. When you learn, when you learn about animals, when you learn about structure, very few examples are normally sufficient to learn. And as I showed the case of this animal in a jungle, if you need 40,000 uh, examples to learn to what is a wild cat or what is a lion, you are very unlikely to survive in the jungle. And that's why, that's why we want to work 300 samples or even much more, three or four. So that's where we are. Now, clearly, that's not the final solution of uh, classification. Why? Because images are much more complex than that. You don't just have translation and local deformation. If you want to classify bicycles, you'd like to understand bicycles and in some sense take the bicycle class and squeeze it to a single point exactly as we take all possible translation and squeeze it. Okay? So once you've done this local translation invariance, you are going to get a manifold, which is locally regular, but which may not be flat in the same case as digit. And what you want to do is just continue. Flatten progressively your manifold. And to do that, you can continue to apply scattering operators, but not relatively to the translation group, but other groups G. 
And the key idea is once you understand the math, you can do that exactly in the same way. Why? Because the principle, the essential idea was make a wavelet transform, kill the phase, and just iterate on that. Well, you do the same thing, but the wavelet transform, which is not built on the translation group, but on the Lie group that you need, on which you need to build your environment. So you build the wavelets on the Lie group, and then you make the wavelet transform modulus, and then you cascade the same thing. And that is flattening your structure relatively to the variation of your Lie. So essentially, the idea is, again, reduce variability with iterated contractive operators, which are built in order to make sure that there is one direction that you don't affect too much, is the deformation direction, to avoid having your two classes collapse together. So the conclusion. Well, the first conclusion is image representation for classification is still a mystery. It's a very beautiful idea. I think there is a lot of very interesting mathematics that now can be done, and there are very elegant algorithms that have been developed in computer vision that needs to be much better understood now. One thing that is behind all that is the proposition to try to attack classification problem through contractive operators. Basically, the idea is take a class, don't think about the rest, essentially, and try to reduce the variability of the class trying not to reduce it in a too stupid way in order not to collapse with the other classes. From a math point of view, there is an interesting question coming out. Is, is there any other way to build a representation which is translation invariant and Lipschitz continues <coughs> to deformations? And as I said, it's not so clear because to build this Lipschitz continuity, you need to deal with all scale. Now, why is the question uh, somewhat interesting? Because in the brain, we know that we are able to do this thing. We know that we are able to have a very clear perception of deformation and be insensitive to translation. So if there are not so many ways to do it from a mathematical point of view, maybe this is implemented in neurophysiology. And what's interesting is that in the audio, there is some very interesting work done by Shehad Shama for many years. And what we realize is that essentially the physiological model that he has is the same kind of cascade. Filter banks in the cochlea and then taking the envelope. Filtering envelope, filtering envelope. Exactly uh, the same kind of cascade. Is that the case for all neurophysiology? Uh, for really audio, I don't know, but at least these are the type of models being developed. So there are papers, software for anyone interested and uh, Thank you very much.